Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Dharna Noor, coming to you from Baltimore. Methane is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases that gets trapped in the Earth's atmosphere. And new research suggests that the global level of methane emissions from livestock is significantly higher than previously thought. The recent study, called Revised Methane Emissions Factors and Spatially Distributed Annual Carbon Fluxes for Global Livestock, says that previous estimates, which are based on 2006's data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, are low. I'm pleased to be joined by one of the co-authors of the study to discuss it. Dr. Gassam Asrar is the director of Joint Global Change Research Institute, a partnership between the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the University of Maryland. Previously, he's worked with NASA. He was also the deputy administrator for Natural Resources and Agricultural Systems with Agricultural Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and has served as the director of the World Climate Research Program in Geneva, Switzerland. He's received numerous awards and honors, including the NASA Exceptional Performance Award, the National Distinguished Service Medal, and the NASA Medal for Outstanding Leadership. Welcome to The Real News Network, sir. Thank you. So, Let's get right into it. Um, what are the key takeaways from this recent study? Basically, uh, we can now explain some of the increases in the atmospheric methane concentrations that uh, have been observed since uh, 2007. And we can attribute some of, of those increases to livestock, um, changes in the population, the size and distribution of livestock globally. And um, this is important because there are two major contributing factors to these increased <clears throat> methane emissions uh, by uh, agricultural system, this part of the agricultural systems, primarily livestock. One is the traits or the characteristics of um, livestock themselves, their size and uh, their type. And the other factor is the way that the effluents um, that are uh, secreted by the animals are being managed increasingly in large ponds because of uh, the way the livestock are raised in um, um, especially in the U.S., in North America, and increasingly in Latin America and also in Asia. Uh, by knowing uh, the source or the cause of the methane from livestock, we can manage those emissions more effectively. As such, the intent of this uh, study was to find the root cause of this increase and offer some suggestions as how to manage it so that we can curtail the emission of methanes from livestock into the atmosphere. Now, you mentioned the increasing size of these livestock animals, um, but are there not also simply more livestock animals being reared due to population growth and growing consumption of meat? Absolutely. This was one of uh, the interesting findings of, of the study was we see significant regional variations. Uh, for example, surprisingly, we found that the emissions in Europe have been declining. We found that the emissions in Asia are increasing. The emissions in Canada and um, U.S. more or less stayed the same or declined slightly. This suggests that basically um, in parts of the world that the population is growing rapidly, increasingly uh, are, uh, there is demand for uh, meat uh, commensurate with the increase in the population of livestock, the emissions are also in those, uh, parts of the world. So this uh, was somewhat revealing because in previous studies uh, focused on having an estimate of globally and through our study we uh, found a way to identify, quantify the regional variation uh, as well, which is very, very important to the nation, region, world, whereby they have committed to reduce the emissions in order to support the Paris Agreement. And by providing the finding of the study, they'll be able to manage um, the methane emission more effectively, especially, as I said, in parts of the world where the emissions have been increasing uh, over the past couple of decades. 
So could you please tell us how you came to these conclusions globally? Um, what methodology you and your co-authors used in layperson's terms? Absolutely. One thing that we did, we wanted to make sure that when we compare our results with the previously estimates, the methodology is the same. In other words, we use exactly the same process uh, and the methods and calculations that uh, the Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change had used in 2006. What, I, what we did differently was to focus on the data, to make sure that we have most up-to-date um, data regionally, at the national level, at the uh, global level, and differentiate among different types of livestock, um, the type of management practices that are used in different parts of the world by different nations. We focused on the details uh, that made a significant contribution to the derived estimates. As such, uh, we find that spending time and energy on keeping a good record of uh, the type, the population, and the distribution of the livestock at the national level, plus how the nations are managing uh, the, uh, basically, the effluents from the animals is extremely important to come up with reliable estimates. And as such, our estimates indicate that indeed, it really is important um, to have good record um, and good record keeping at the national and, and in the international level. And could you talk more about those management practices? Um, of course, it's not so pleasant to talk about, but a large part of this, that, uh, as your study showed, is the management of manure. Um, could you talk about what you found uh, could be done better in terms of these, uh, in terms of these management practices? Absolutely. You know, in some parts of the world, it's still uh, they use free range and the distributed um, livestock on on the grassland or the grazing land. Um, basically, um, is is a much more efficient way of um, uh, using uh, the effluents for um, returning back to soil. For example, when we have large concentration of um, the livestock, which makes it much more efficient in terms of management and reducing the energy uh, lost by um, moving animals around, uh, we basically create large concentration and, and all the effluents are collected in a pond and as such uh, the, the emissions from those ponds also are greater. And uh, if we could uh, find a way to capture, for example, those emissions, which some um, countries and nations do and use them as a source uh, for heating. Uh, that would be an effective way of even if we have large concentrations uh, and large ponds, we capture the methane and use it as a source of um, energy. That would be an effective way of uh, reducing the emission back to the atmosphere, for example. What are some of the countries that are currently doing that? Yes, um, uh, increasingly some countries that they don't have energy sources internally, they use the methane digesters to capture the methane and reuse it for heating uh, or operation of uh, their facilities, for example. Uh, and, wh and what are some of the countries that are currently using those practices? Uh, mostly in African countries, they use that, do that. Um, China and uh, some uh, other countries in, in Asia are also um, using that practice more and more frequently because every time that they sort of capture and use the methane, they don't have to rely on, the, for example, the petroleum-based sources of energy for heating and cooling and, and operation of their uh, feedlot facilities. So let's talk about the impact of these methane emissions. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency previously estimated methane being 34 times heavier than carbon dioxide, while others have estimated that methane is as much as 86 times stronger at trapping heat in the atmosphere than CO2 uh, over a 100-year time scale. So what is the consensus among scientists who specialize in this field? What's the relative impact of CO2 <clears throat> versus methane? Well, absolutely, everybody is in agreement that the warming potential of methane is significantly uh, higher than CO2, 
however, the, uh, the, um, the life expectancy of methane is much, much shorter than CO2. Um, CO2 stays in the atmosphere for uh, almost a um, century plus. Methane uh, lifespan is uh, less than you know, a season or a year. Uh, so uh, that is the trade-off between the two. Uh, and of course, a concentration of methane in the atmosphere is significantly um, um, less than CO2. So the main reason for focusing on understanding uh, the total concentration, the sources, is to be able uh, to quantify a methane contribution to the warming potential of the atmosphere in the future. Um, you know, as important as a significant is um, uh, methane release, for example, from livestock. Uh, there are other contributing factors uh, from agricultural, such as rice paddies. Um, when you combine all of that together, um, still is a small component of the to total um, methane cycle um, for the planet Earth. The biggest worry among scientists is potential uh, warming of the high latitudes, the northern latitudes, where currently there is a very large amount of methane is captured um, uh, in, in, in that part of the world it's because it's frozen, it's cold, and God forbid if that part of the, um, the planet warms up, uh, the concentration, the amount of methane that is going to be released to the atmosphere would be much, much larger than what currently agricultural systems contribute to. Now, I want to finish by asking you about the repercussions of your study's findings in terms of previous calculations for lowering greenhouse gas emissions in the United States um, and what can be done to curb growing emissions from livestock. Indeed, uh, again, what that was one um, major objective of the study to find out the root causes. As I stated, uh, clearly, uh, now that we know where the, um, what are the major contributing factors to the methane emission from livestock, uh, the countries can um, use that information, that knowledge to manage their emissions much more effectively. For example, out of the 190 plus countries that have signed the Paris Agreement, uh, almost 80% of them plan to use land-related practices, agricultural system, forestry, um, as a way to manage their carbon footprint, to manage the, uh, their emissions. And clearly, here's a tool for them. Here's an area of um, a potential uh, you know, management practice for them to, as I stated, even if they plan to use large feedlots for production of the meat to meet their population demand, um, there are better ways of managing uh, the emissions from those ponds by capturing and reusing that. And that way, on one hand, they can reduce the footprint on the uh, emissions, and on the other hand, they can uh, basically gain a new source of energy. Of course, that process um, requires investment um, and, um, you know, economically might be uh, a bit expensive up front. But when you look at it uh, over the long term, uh, we believe the payoff uh, will be significant. Again, by curbing their emissions and gaining uh, more or less energy from it, um, you have a, you know, accomplished two objectives um, at the same time. And this is the type of solution that we really need to continue to come up with in order to be able to uh, manage the carbon, our carbon footprint on the atmosphere. Okay, Dr. Gusum Ustrar, thank you so much for joining us today. My great pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.